Okay, uh, welcome back to our lectures. This is the second lecture of the day, um, and our third lecture on small x physics. Uh, without further ado, I would let Edmond uh, continue the lectures on, on this topic. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, so, I just prepared one single slide to remember where we left yesterday. So we have started exploring aspects of people scattering of the, of the dense gluon distribution. And to do that in a most simple setup, we have uh, selected a relatively simple observable, which is a quark anti quark color dipole, as a pink saying in the uh, high energy factorization of deep elastic scattering. And this called dipole scatters of a, of a dense gluon distribution, which in self, itself is described by a very single model, a Gaussian model which is a, known as the mclaren van Gopelen model, and which applies in principle to a very large nucleus, and which is characterized by two, only a two-point function of the color charge density with this local structure. So, um, given the color charge density, we have shown how to can solve the classical Yamis equations. In fact, they, in the covariant gauge, they just amount to the Poisson equation in two dimensions, like in QED. So it's a trivial problem to solve. Now, given this field A minus as a function of rho, we can compute the Wilson line, which enters the dipole, in the dipole S matrix, and then we can average over the rows by using this Gaussian. And because of the simplicity of the equation and of the averaging, all these um, operations can be done explicitly, leading to explicit analytic results, which allow for a transparent physical interpretation. So now I return to, to the point where we stop. We, we have the solution of the classical fields. I would like to compute the expectation value of the Wilson line. Good. So, uh, so dipole scattering is the MV model. That's a dipole, that's a medium of size L, the dipole propagates with one leg at X perp, one other leg at Y perp. It propagates over a time L through the medium, and it undergoes in general multiple scattering. That's a single scattering, that's a multiple scattering. But what is specific about having independent color charges, so the fact that the, the color sources have this delta distribution, so they don't, two different charges don't communicate with each other, is the fact that the multiple scattering series simply exponentiates. That is, the S matrix for arbitrary many scatterings is simply the exponential of minus the scattering amplitude for a single scattering. So this is a scattering amplitude for a single scattering with the two gluon exchange. I remember we have, we have already computed that previous, previously, um, well, Yes, on this slide, we have computed that by expanding the Wilson lines up to quadratic order, and then taking the product of two Wilson lines, and taking, uh, taking the color trace, which generates this, this, um, uh, this um, quadratic form in the gauge fields at x perp and y perp squared, and the difference between the quark and anti-quark scattering. And then we, uh, we take the expectation value of this one. Now we compute that with the, within the NV model. That was so just for a single scattering in that context, now I argue that since we compute multiple scattering in the, in, in the, for a system of independent color charges, then multiple scattering is as simple as simple scattering, a single scattering. It's enough to exponentiate single scattering to get a result from multiple scattering. That is to prove, I will not prove that in detail. So I return to the calculation at hand, which is here. So the S matrix with multiple scattering, as represented by this cartoon, is computed from the T matrix for a single scattering T0, which is this quadratic form in the gauge field. And that, this has to be averaged over the color glass wave function, which in this case is just a Gaussian wave function. Uh, the gauge fields appear here, depends upon X per per quark, Y per per anti quark. These are the gauge integrated over the original profile of, of the target. So the integration of X plus goes from zero to L. Now, given the solution to the Poisson equation and the correlators of the rows here, it is straightforward to compute the correlators of A at X perp Y perp, so integrate over X plus and Y, or, um, and y plus. And this correlator is the color, uh, the delta function in color, and then it's a product of two Coulomb, uh, Coulomb propagators. I remind you that each A minus here is the inverse of a Coulomb propagator, one with K perp squared in momentum space. When you have two exchanges, we have one with K perp fourth, and then Fourier transform to X minus Y. And the mu squared is simply the color charge the strength of the color charge squared integrated over, over X plus from zero to L, which means it's a color charge squared per unit transverse area, and indeed has the dimension of a mass, color charge squared per unit transverse area. And that's the fundamental parameter of the MV model, the only parameter of the MV model. 
of course, this integration of K prep here is awfully um, um, divergent because uh, when K prep goes to zero, this is a quadratic divergence. Uh, but as a matter of fact, when you compute the scattering amplitude, we have two terms. We have scat terms describing the scattering of, of both the quark and the anti quark, or the terms, the platform terms, in which either only the quark scatters or only the anti quark scatters, and there's a compensation between the two types of contribution which makes that the overall scattering amplitude has only a logarithmic divergence. So you see, when we de develop the square here, we have terms like A of X squared, this gives a one, because it's no, no depends upon X minus Y, and we have terms like A of X, A of Y, which depends upon X minus Y, which I do not as, as an error. So error here is a, is a vector X minus Y. So the one comes from the tadpole terms, and the exponential AK dot R comes from the terms where the, couple, uh, where the scattering of the quark and the, and the scattering of the anti-quark are coupled to each other via this in medium correlator. And this compensation between, uh, uh, between uh, scattering of the same quark and the scattering of a pair of quarks is typical for a dipole, which, because the dipole is, is overall color neutral. So in case um, the, the transit momentum K pair becomes arbitrarily weak, this means that this, this exchange is here very long range, but in that case, these exchanges do not distinguish between the quark and the anti-quark. They only see an overall color singlet system, which has no charge, so there should be no scattering. And indeed, when R goes to zero, exponential k dot R is, is one, this just cancels, so there is no scattering. This will explain the cancellation. Now, in spite of this cancellation, there is still a log divergence which is, uh, um, um, which is remaining, and to lead in log accuracy, one can evaluate this integral by expanding the exponential, to quadratic order, the linear order one goes away, the linear term go, goes away by, by angular integration, by angular averaging, and the quadratic term, which gives an R squared piece, uh, is the one which survives, and which generates a log divergent, because you have K squared from here, K4 from there, so you have B to K or K squared, which is a log. That's a log, and I, the, the, the log um, is cut in the ultraviolet at one over R, because this is where the exponential starts to, to, to become unimportant, and then we have a divergent integration at high K perp, and in the infrared, a small k perp, I just cut it by hand at the, uh, at the confinement scale because this physics is really sensitive to the confinement scale, but only, only in a logarithmic way. So that's the scattering amplitude in a single scattering approximation or two-gluon exchange approximation, which is essentially the same as the, the, the standard gluon distribution of the, of the target, of the, of the nucleus. And now I just exponentiate that to obtain the S matrix for multiple scattering to all orders. And that's very simple, so I just take the formula from here. We write it in a slightly different way, and I put in the exponent, so this is the convenient rewriting. So the, the, this new scale, Q0A squared, which has the dimension of momentum squared, is just alpha S times CF times the previous scale mu squared. And this scale, Q0 squared, A depends upon the atomic number as A to the power one third, because so does mu squared. And so, what's the physics of this, of this, of this formula here? Very simple formula. So first of all, the, the, the dipole propagates through the medium, and essentially interacts of all the quarks within an area of the order of the dipole size, R squared, so the quark the quarks that he meets along the way, and in a tube of, of size L, because he, can, he propagates through the whole nucleus, so it interacts with all the quarks which is on, within its own area and within a distance L, and since this distance L is proportional to the, to the radius of the nucleus, which itself is proportional to a one third, this explains why this scale here is proportional to a one third. Now, the, the exponent here vanishes as r squared when r goes to zero, which is just a statement of cold transparency, the fact that the dipole of zero size does not scatter, and this comes out, as I mentioned before, because of cancellations between scatterings of either only the quark or only the anti-quark or the pair quark anti-quark. And finally, the log here is because the, the Coulomb exchanges are non-local, so the, when I said the dipole scatter of the quarks within his area, it's a bit of exaggeration. He can also scatter of, of quarks which are a bit off away from his, uh, from his area, but within a distance which is logarithmically distributed delta x perp between the dipole size and one over lambda of lambda QCD, cut over in by confinement. So all the valence quarks within an area of this size contribute to this uh, scattering via uh, this logarithmic um, Coulomb exchange. Okay, so that's... Um, it's a very simple result that the S matrix in the MV model for multiple scattering. What can we do with it? First of all, we can study saturation. So, physics wise, S of R is the probability for the dipole to survive in a color singlet state. So, when S is one, there is no scattering. 
when s is zero, the dipole has total, totally changed the color from the singlet to anything, because the, the dipole cannot disappear. It just propagates through the medium. But it started by being in a color singlet state, and then it, it exchanges gluon to the medium, so it can change his color after each scattering. And the, the dipole, S matrix is, is a probability that this does not happen, that it has propagated through the medium, it has undergone many scatterings, but these scatterings are correlated between the quark and the antiquark in such a way that the color state at the end be the same as the color state at the beginning. And of course, this probability is more than one because each of these scatterings could change the color. So this is indeed more than one. Um, and the, with, there are two interesting regimes. So if the dipole size R is small enough, then this exponent here is small enough, we're in the weak scattering or single scattering regime, T0 is much more than one, then we can expand exponential to leading order, the single, and then the full scattering amplitude T is the same as the single scattering amplitude, because we're in the, the single scattering approximation, and they're both much more than one. That's the regime of core transparency or weak scattering or single scattering. The more interesting regime is when the scattering comes strong, when this, the full scattering amplitude is of order one. This means that the exponent here, which is T0, is of order one as, as well. And this clearly, uh, this clearly happens when R is large enough, so there is a critical size R for which the dipole commutes from a weak scattering regime to a strong scattering regime, and that typical size R defines the saturation moment. So it is conventionally defined, the saturation moment to create this convention defined such that the exponent here be of order one when R is two over QS. The factor of two is just conventional. But the important is that R and, Q and 1 over QS are in this proportional when this is for the 1. So if you just replace here R by 2 over QS, uh, and you say that this is equal to 1, you get an equation for QS, which is here, QS squared is, is, has a scale, which is set by this scale. This scale was a part of the exponent, but now QS squared is not exactly that scale. There is an additional um, log factor because you replace here 1 over R squared by 4 over QS squared, you can see it. Okay. So, QS is essentially Q0, so it goes essentially like, like way a to power one third. It's slightly bigger than Q0 because this logarithm is bigger than one because the saturation scale is a hard scale, semi-hard scale, it's bigger than lambda QCD, so this logarithm, the argument here is bigger than one, the logarithm is bigger than, the, well, the, the, log, the argument is bigger than E if you want, and the logarithm is bigger than one. So, and the, and the saturation scale in the ME model, it scales like a one third, logarithm of one a or third. This logarithm is not really essential, but it's just interesting conceptually because it shows the dependence upon the Coulomb tail. It's important on, on a physical way. Okay, so in this problem, we have studied multiple scattering in the covariant gauge. So we don't see explicit saturation in the nucleus. All the fields of the, um, um, the field in the nucleus is linear, it's created independently by the sources, but we see nonlinear physics in the form of multiple scattering. So this is multiple scattering. So the probe sees nonlinear physics. But the, 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 the wave function of the, of the MV model in this particular gauge has no saturation. I, I explain to you why, because that's the gauge dependent statement. And this is uh, just a cartoon of this, a um, uh, graphic representation of this function from here in two ways. First, I represent simply the S matrix as a function of R. So there's a probability for having no, um, um, well, to, 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 for preserving the, the, the dipole structure. This probability is one when R is zero because there is no scattering and it decreases with R and essentially becomes for the, uh, for the one, uh, much more than one when R is one with QS somewhere around here. And separately, I have, uh, I have uh, represented the dipole amplitude, which is one minus S, and as a function not of R, but of, of the logarithmic variable, logarithm of one over R squared Q zero squared, that's a convenient way to represent for what follows. So this is the way I will generally show the saturation front in general. So in this case, you see, R and rho are inverse proportional. So a small dipole, much more than one over QS, corresponds to a large value of rho, which is this tail here. And in that tail, we can expand the exponent from here. So T is essentially T0. And this T0 grows like R squared, which means it goes like exponential minus rho in this notation. So this is an exponential tail. That's a perturbative tail in the weak scattering regime. On the other hand, large dipoles, so for the one over QS or larger, corresponds to negative value of rho, because then R is here is large, so this is, uh, um, this is negative, this is more than one, sorry. Uh, so the rho is negative, which is you see on the left on that, and you see that on the left on that, T is one, because we're just in the, in the, in the strong scattering regime, so we're in the regime where the exponent here is bigger than one, so the S matrix is zero, and hence the T matrix is one. 
And this regime where the T matrix is one is called also the black disk limit. It's a limit in which the dipole has not survived the medium. The quark and the antiquark, they do survive, but they go out in a different color state, so the dipole does not survive the medium. That's a black disk limit. So we have, if you want to, a transition between black disk limit and color transparency. And that, uh, that's called the saturation front. And later on, we shall study the evolution of the saturation front with increasing energy. For the time being, we're just in the MV model. There is no energy dependence. OK, um, still in the MV model, I return to the other physics problem we discussed before. Besides the DIS, we discussed another dilute dense problem, which was the proton nucleus collision. So we, we're asking the question, what is the spectrum of the produced particles, quarks, in the PA collision at four rapidity? And we have argued that, the, that quarks, which are originally collinear with the proton, undergo multiple scattering inside the nucleus, and they emerge with some standard momentum p-perp, which is given by this multiple scattering, so it's of order qs. So that's the quark crossing the medium, interacting many times with the gauge field A minus scattered by the color sources here. The same format as before. The quark enters with k perp zero, it exits with k perp non zero. Here is p perp, here is k perp, just notations are different. But Okay, so these are multiple random scattering, so we expect some distribution in the final momentum, and we like to compute this distribution. It's going to be like a random walk. And for computing this, again, we can rely on the acorn approximation. I already anticipated that by showing an x a, a, a straight light trajectory at fixed x -perp. Yes? Say again, please. Uh, that S matrix that you showed, does it satisfy unitarity? Yes, of course. Uh, is, uh, I cannot see from the expression. Can you? So if this goes to infinity, this goes to, 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 to zero. S goes to zero. So that unitarity means T equal one. T cannot become bigger than one, so obviously. It's an exponential. OK, so uh, in the R goes to infinity limit. Yes, that goes to infinity limit is like this limit. If it takes only the single scattering, uh, um, the single scattering approximation, which is just the exponent, would explode at large error. So of course, the single scattering approximation becomes arbitrarily large. And that is violating unitarity. But the multiple, uh, so it's a very good point. In the, the resummation of the multiple scattering to all the orders restores the unitarity. But that was built in, because we work with Wilson line. So we, the Wilson line, for any given configuration of the, of the field, it's a unitary matrix, so it's satisfying unitarity. If you average of the configuration, you get again a site which satisfies unitarity by construction. Question. So that logarithm at large R will have a divergence, right? This, this, uh, yeah. the, uh, is that physical? If R becomes very large, then that logarithm will be negative, right? And then the exponential. Right. No, no. This, this logarithm is obtained under the, under the, so this, this log the expansion here. Is a, is a faithful approximation of this expression, yes. so long as 1 over r is, is bigger than lambda. So it, well, the log cannot become negative. Uh, if, you wanna, uh, if you wanna work more precise, you can put here a lambda squared in the, the denominator, and then you will never see just the log. You see the log plus the constant, and the whole will be never negative. Because this is, neg this is never negative. This is, can become negative, but this is only an approximation when, when r is big. So you don't have dipole sizes bigger than confinement radius. So that's an approximation value when the dipole sizes are, are still smaller than confinement radius. Can that expression be computed analytically without making this approximation? Is it possible? Has anyone studied it? Uh, well, you have to put a, you have to, to define the regulator. Uh, yes, yes. I think so. I think it's a better function. If you put here as a plus lambda squared, all of that squared, I think the whole integration becomes a, a modified Bessel function. But, not so important. Well, numerically, you just put a lambda squared in the denominator and then compute it numerically. OK, so let me return to the, the less trivial problems, which, which, which is the momentum browning here. So again, I want to compute the transfer momentum browning by using the acorn approximation. And everything I did before holds. I don't have to do anything new. I, I know the result. I just want to use it. So for the time being, sorry, I had only one quark scattering, but that's the amplitude. I want to compute the, the cross-section for producing the quark with a given k perp. How do I compute that? I have to take the product of the amplitude and the complex conjugate amplitude. So in the final state, I have the same k perp in the amplitude and the final complex conjugate amplitude, because that's the k perp I want to measure. This k perp is obtained from the Wilson line in the coordinate representation by a Fourier transform. So I, I compute the, 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 the amplitude 
so it's a direct amplitude and separate the complex conic amplitude by by first working in coordinate representation, then the amplitude is just a Wilson line in at X perp, and then I make a Fourier transform from X perp to K perp. Similarly, the complex quantity amplitude is just a, the a complex conjugate of this quantity. So it's the same quantity, the same K perp, but of course there will be a different integration variable that I call Y perp. And I have a Wilson line at Y perp, which is the complex conjugate of this one. And after changing the indices, just the Hermitian conjugate. So when I complete the cross section, I take in this times his complex conjugate and summing over all the core indices because I have to average over initial indices and sum over final ones. Then what I reconstruct here is just the trace of two Wilson lines, which is a dipole. So the dipole appears again in the problem of a single quark. In DIS, we had the physical dipole because the virtual photon really fluctuates into a QQ bar pair. Here I have an un, a non-physical dipole, a mathematical dipole, which comes out because we're going to compute a cross section for a quark. And a cross section means amplitude times complex conjugate amplitude. I have a, a quark at x perp in the amplitude, an anti-quark effectively at y perp in complex conjugate amplitude. And when I make the product of the two and I take the color trace, I generate mathematically dipole again. So this process too is expressible in terms of a dipole factorization. I have a dipole factorization this time for the cross section for producing a quark with a given k perp in proton nucleus collisions. And you see, the, 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 this, this cross section is a, simply the Fourier transform from x and y to k. I go from x to k and from y to k. Uh, so I, if I go here, I have to go from x to y to k. Of course, I have two integrations. The one over the relative variable x minus y, which is dipole size r, is, is fixing the momentum k. And the other one is integrating over the whole the surface of the, of the nucleus, which gives me a cross section. If I divide out the cross section, so I divide out one of the integration, I just obtain the multiplicity, the number of particles and not the cross section. And what I'm doing on the next slide. So now I, here I have considered the cross section for an incoming quark, sorry, incoming proton. So I also have the, the quark distribution giving me the probability to find the quark with a given XP inside the, inside the proton. Now I just take an incoming quark for simplicity. So there's no quark distribution any longer. And I divide out the area of the, of the target. So I don't have a cross section anymore. I have a spectrum. I have the number, the probability, the number of particles is one. I start with one quark, it remains one. The number of quarks is conserved. But I would like to ask, what's the probability to have that quark with a given transit momentum in the final state? And this probability is simply the Fourier transform of the dipolar matrix, which I call here S of K. So S of X minus Y, Fourier transform becomes S of K. And I, I do that, I, I compute the spectrum in, in envy model. I know already S of R in coordinate representation. I just computed before. I have to take a Fourier transform. So you see, the calculation I did before for the dipole scattering in the envy model was useful for DIS as it stands. But now if I take a Fourier transform with it, it's useful for PA. It's a very simple setup, which allows to, to drive a lot of conclusions from a same, from a same simple calculation. So you, if you look at this integration over R here, it's almost a Gaussian. This is, looks like a Gaussian, but there's a log here. And this log complicates a bit about mathematics. But there are two interesting situations in which one can get exact an IT result. So the most interesting situation is when the external k perp is of the order of QS. This is an external variable. We expect the typical k perp to be of order QS because the quark undergoes collisions inside the medium, so can only keep, pick up a moment of order k, QS typically. If, if k perp is of order QS, then this integration over R here, it cut off by the S matrix. And this happens at, so see, this integration, when R goes to infinity, it, uh, the exponential here goes to zero, and it cuts off the integration. And when this happens, this happens when the exponent becomes of order one. And so long as the exponent is much more than one, the integration is dominated by the upper limit. So in other terms, the integration is dominated by the highest value of R, which is allowed by the integrand. And that higher value of R, which is allowed by the integrand, is the one at which the exponent here becomes of order one, which is precisely what we find before a saturation momentum. So we know that in this regime, this integration is dominated by R of order one over QS. Because that's true, then we can in, in, you can approximate the log in here by replacing one over R squared inside the log as Q, as Q sub squared, because that's a slowly varying function and the whole contribution comes from that point. Once you do that, then it becomes a genuine, a genuine uh, Gaussian integration, because this whole uh, exponent here is just R squared Q sub squared. Right, because I replace Q0 squared as a log in one over R by Q0 times, times the log in of, of Q sub squared, which is Q sub squared itself. So I have a Gaussian integration, it's trivial. And, I, uh, and uh, after Fourier transform, it gives me a Gaussian momentum. That's a Gaussian. So I have a, a Gaussian distribution. If I compute in particular the expectation value of k per squared, it's obviously the same as saturation momentum. 
So as expected, the, the, the particle, the quark, undergoes random walk in transit momentum because it suffers uh, random kicks from the medium. And it goes out to the typical momentum of the order of the typical momenta that it can receive, which is saturation scale. This is random work because it goes, if you want, it goes linear with the medium size. Two sub squared with this portion with the medium size L, as I, say, as I said before. And the other interesting regime where you can make the calculation simple is the high K purple limit. You can ask the question, what's the probability for the quark to go out with a very high K purple much larger than QS? Well, that's possible too, because one particle can, can the, the quark can scatter of, an in, of a quark inside the medium by rather for cross section and get out with a very large K perp. That's, it's a very unlikely process because it has a low probability, but it's possible. And one, one K perp is much bigger than QS, then the integration is cut off by the exponential here, but at K of order, at L of order one over K, because for L of order one over K, the exponent here is much more than one, so the, the, the S matrix is not cutting anything. In fact, the S matrix can be expanded to the single scattering approximation because the exponent is much more than one. So if you expand, if you replace the exponential here by just the exponent of it, then the Fourier transform of the log gives a power one over K force. So instead of having a Gaussian, which is the case for K per of order QS, you have a power law, but it's only value for K per much bigger than QS. So the spectrum interpolates between a Gaussian at small K per and a power law tail at large K per. And this power law tail is just the hallmark of two to two scattering. That's a rather, that's a rather for cross section. But here you have only this rather for cross section in the limit of single scattering, single hard scattering. If, if the scattering is soft, it cannot be single. It has to be multiple because then all the scattering uh, import on the same footing and you have this full exponent. But if the K per, if you insist of K per, on caper being very, very large, then the multiple scattering plays no role. We have just a single hard scattering. And that's a, that's a spectrum. So what I represent here is a function k times s of k. Why, why do I represent this function? Because uh, uh, if you compute, for instance, the expectation value here, what really matters is, uh, is, is so what really matters is, is, a, is the, we have also a factor k from the measure. So you only compute an expectation value of k to power n, you also have power of k from the measure, because of the two-dimensional measure here, which, which is k dk. So the, the, the real uh, prob probability distribution for the function s of modules of k is not just s of, is not just dm by d2k, or s of k is the same. Yeah, s of k is the same as dm by 2k, it's a Fourier transform. So, but it's s of k times k. And this s of k times k, it's a Gaussian at small k perp and has a power low tail at large k perp. This is in normal unit, this is in logarithmic units. You can see the again, that's the Gaussian, that's the power low tail. And that's, that's typical for this multiple scattering, this single scattering. Okay, questions? Yeah. It's, it's almost, uh, well, well, technically, so more mathematically, it's almost irrelevant. It's just conceptually important. Uh, because what is important? Because it shows that the, the physical saturation scale has a running with the hard momentum in the problem. So that's the beginning of the Diglaff evolution, if you want. So the, the, the saturation scale of the moment is not just a scale set by initial condition, but it's a scale multiplied by its own evolution. So this, this scale in the beginning is just a measure of the color charge squared of the valence part per unit area. It's something that you put inside the nucleus. But then knowing the color charge square per unit area, how do you compute the scale at which the dipole unit rises? That turned out to be very close to that one, but it, it also fills, it also fills scatterings, low range exchanges, and these long range exchanges are cut off by the dipole size itself. So the scale here is also the scale which cuts off the logarithmic the ultraviolet. So this is just a RG evolution of that one. That one will be the three level one. That is the RG improvement of it. And of course, that, that's just the beginning in a, in a, in a high, in, in a, in a log, log Q squared evolution. That comes out from a semi classical approximation. But mathematics, so these are conceptual difference. Physically, this and this are essentially the same because the log is small. It's a number for the one. And then another question. Uh, so in this model, you don't have correlations between different. Uh... Charges. Charges, yeah. No, I mean, uh, sorry, in the momentum broadening. Yes. Uh, yes, it is uh, yes, independent of it's just a random walk, yes. It's a Gaussian. 
Yeah, because, uh, yeah, because uh, the medium is a collection of independent valence quarks. And the probe scatters independently of each of them. It gets kicks from one, kicks from the other in a random way. On the average, the random momentum remains zero, but it gets a broadening. And that's, that generic, that's the same kind of discussion will apply to jet quenching in my late tomorrow lectures. Would be more, more, more interesting. Here it's just a curiosity. That's not so important. So, that, so, 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 so good with the ENVI model. So, so far we have totally ignored the high energy evolution. The ENVI model was a model for the gluon distribution of a nucleus, which is large, but has low energy. So, the, the whole, of, um, the, the whole color charge was associated with the valence quarks. There was no gluon ladder adding to the color charge. Now we're going to a situation where we have gluon ladders. So we like to have the dipole scattering out of an evolved target, and the target is now described by an evolved color glass weight function, which depends on the rapidity separation between the projectile and the target. And you see these ladders here are supposed to be gluons, which add on top on the valence quarks to build the gluon distribution of the nucleus at the scale probe by the dipole. The dipole is still there, but it's probing now an evolved gluon distribution. And this evolved gluon distribution is mathematically described by this color glass weight function, which evolves according to the Gibbon equation that I will introduce later, with initial condition at low energy given by, by the MV model. So in this way, this Gibbon evolution is referred to the distribution in the target. It, it amounts to adding gluon emission, which have lower lower value of x, where x now is a fraction of p minus because the target is a, it's a left mover down to the scale g, which is propped by the by the projectile. And in, and in this evolution, which is complicated, we have nonlinear effect both in the in the evolution and the, in the in the collision. This evolution has to be computed in the Lycon gauge of the target, which is a left mover, so it is a minus equal zero. So it's a complicated calculation. So it is much easier to use the trick I discussed yesterday to to boost the, the system from the frame in which you have evolution in the target to the frame in which you have evolution in the projectile. In this case, nonlinear effects get mapped into splittings. So instead of merging, you have splittings. And multiple scattering gets mapped into fluctuations. And it's much easier to treat fluctuation in the dilute system than, than recombination in the dense system. But the, mathemat so the, the physical conclusion is the same, and the, the observables are going to be the same. So in, in, in this boosted frame, the whole evolution is, is, is a part of the wave function of the, of the dipole. So the factorization scale is here. The, the proton, or the nucleus in general, is a bare object, as described by the MV model, if it's a large nucleus, just balanced quarks. But the gluons, now the gluon letters are a part of the, of the uh, uh, dipole wave function. And whenever I have a splitting, I have to allow for the product of the two splittings to separately interact with the nucleus, because these this simultaneous interactions are the equivalent of the nonlinear effect in the wave function here. The, once again, the calculation has this simple physical interpretation only in the Lycon gauge of the projectile. So wh while this calculation here has this picture in the Lycon gauge of the target, A minus equals zero, this calculation has this picture here in the Lycon gauge of the projectile, which is a Roy mover, and which is A plus equals zero. So I'm going to show you to you the result and the physical interpretation in the Lycon gauge A plus equals zero. Okay, so dipole evolution. From now on, the target is just a shock wave, and the model, and this is a projectile, and these are some, some gluons that I don't measure, they're small X gluons, but they count for the evolution. So each gluon emission, small X gluon emission, means a probability alpha is log one over X, if X is much more than one, where X in this case is a rotational momentum fraction for the right, for right mover. So if I have a gluon here with rotational momentum P plus, and if the incoming dipole has rotational momentum Q plus, then X is Q plus divided by K plus. Successive emission are strongly ordering in, in X. So if this is the first emission has P plus, the second one has K plus, this K plus is much more than P plus, or if you look at in terms of X, X2, which is K plus divided by Q plus, is much more than X1, which is P plus divided by Q plus. Uh, the transit momenta uh, are not assumed to be ordered. The P perp here and the K perp here are generic. They can be comparable. They can be one bigger than the other one, but they are ordered typically in between the, 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 the hard scale given by the dipole size and the soft scale given by the, uh, the saturation scale in the MV model. So why have this separation between hard scale in the, in the dipole and soft scale in the, in the MV model? Well, you can say that the dipole is small. The, the Q squared is one way squared, so large Q squared means small dipole. We, we, we are not interested in necessarily in small dipole. Otherwise, we'll be only looking at the color transparency regime. But we're looking at, uh, uh, we're interested in dipoles which scatter strongly after high energy evolution. So this Q squared here 
should be of the order of saturation scale in the target after higher energy evolution. But saturation scale in the target increases very fast with the energy. So the saturation scale after high energy evolution is much bigger than the initial saturation scale at zero energy. So if I, if I tune my dipole size to be of the order of QSAT squared at high energy, it is automatically much bigger than QSAT, QSAT squared at zero energy, which is a scale that I put here, which is a reference scale for the MV model. So because of that, I have this hierarchy between the target scale and the projectile scale, and the gluon emissions can be anywhere between these two scales. So strong ordering in X, no, strong, no ordering in k perp means strong ordering in the lifetimes. The lifetime of this gluon is much bigger than that of this one, and so on. So the, the cascades are coined with each other. Um, and the purpose of the game is to resum all the diagrams, which are all the emissions which, which bring a power of alpha y, where y is the log I of 1 over x minimum, and the x minimum is the minimum value of x, actually fixed by, by the kinematics of the scattering. So there is only log I of the energy, there is no log I of transit momentum, and certain momenta can be comparable. And that's called the leading log approximation, or BFKL, or BK, or GMOC, as opposed to DGLAP, which was a leading log approximation in, in transversitis, or as opposed to double log approximation, which was the leading log approximation both in transverse logs and in energy logs. But here is only energy log, so it's leading log approximation at high energy. Okay, so what a, well, uh, to write an evolution equation is good enough to perform one step. So I just do one one gluon emission, and I have various kind of topologies. So it says the gluon. First of all, the um, um, the gluon has to be reabsorbed. Sorry, to be emitted and reabsorbed within the dipole because we want to keep. Color neutrality. We want to evolve the dipole amplitude, so uh, so the dipole should be a, a color signal before the emission and color signal after the emission. So the the gluon cannot go inside the uh, the medium; it has to re be reabsorbed. So that's why all the emissions and ab uh, emission and absorptions happen inside the wave function of the, of the dipole. One single step can have different topologies. The gluon can be emitted by one quark and reabsorbed by the other one. That's an exchange graph, or it can be emitted and reabsorbed by the same quark. That's a self-energy graph. In both cases, the gluon can cross the shock wave or not. It crosses shock wave or not. That's what's called a real contribution, because in this case, the gluon interacts with the, with the target. That's a virtual contribution, because the, 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 the gluon does not interact with the target. It just modifies the probability that we found a bare quark anti quark dipole at the interaction time. So here we have at the interaction time a quark gluon anti quark system. While here we have still a quark gluon system, or quark anti quark system, but with a less probability because of this reduction due to the virtual corrections. And the same here. At the interaction time, here we have quark gluon anti quark. Here we have just quark anti quark but with lesser probability. Altogether, we have eight topologies, four exchange graphs, with, uh, sorry, four crossing, four, four, um, four, uh, four real graphs in which the, the gluon crosses the shock wave and four virtual graphs in which the gluon does not cross the shock wave. Well, they could be also four in the final state, four in the initial state before the shock wave, could be also four after the shock wave. So there are 12 diagrams if you want, but they are very similar. Let me compute for you some of them in more detail. So I'll just focus on exchange graph, the, gl the graph where the gluon is emitted by one of the quarks and the absorbed by the other one, and it either crosses the shock wave, the real term, or it does not the virtual term. So there are two pieces, real and virtual. So, I will turn in a moment to the, to the um, Wilson light to describe the scattering. Let me look, first look at, at, the, uh, at the prefactor here. So this is a change I call D1SY, the change in the S matrix of the dipole due to these two diagrams. It's one here. Delta Y is a rapidity interval for the single, uh, so the single gluon. And we're working on the assumption that alpha DY is much more than one, so that we can emit farther gluon emissions. We we'll do only one step in the evolution. So what does this scanner? If you look at this scanner, you may already recognize the Weizsäcker Williams field. So more precisely, G times one of the factors here is the amplitude for emitting a gluon at Z for, from a source at X. So the gluon is emitted by the quark at X, and it propagates to Z where it scatters of the shock wave. And then is another factor like this one for the gluon being reabsorbed at Y, propagating from Z to Y. So you have another factor of G, maximum alpha S, times the second factor here. And this is really the gluon field in the Lycon gauge. I remind you that yesterday we also computed the gluon field in the Lycon gauge. This is an AI. So in that Lycon gauge for the, for the, for the right mover, A plus is zero, and then the, the non trivial component is AI. And AI has this one over K plus behavior, and then it's a KI divided by the Coulomb propagator. The Fourier transform of K divided by K per square gives the Westaker Williams field. And the integration of K plus over K plus, we've seen the 
within the range of, 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 um, uh, of lotion momentum allowed for this, for this first gluon, give a factor dy. So the factor dy comes from the time of xq plus up to q plus, and this is log n1 over x. So that's a phase space for this gluon. It has any k perp, but with, uh, in such a way to go from x to z, so this fixes the, the, the wave function. And then it has k plus within the strip, which is a, the, the strip that we allow in k plus for the first gluon emission. And of course, then we'll lower this x. We have second emission and so on, third one and so on. And up to this x becomes as small as x minimum. And then we end up with the evolution. But we do that by solving the equation. So we don't have to redo this step. We do one step, we write an equation, and solve the equation. So now coming to the color structure. We have two, two pieces, the real term, the virtual piece. In, in the real term, we have the scattering of a quark, a gluon, of an antiquark and a gluon, we have a Wilson line for the quark at x, a Wilson line complex conjugate for the antiquark at y, a Wilson line in the adjoint representation with a tilde for the gluon at z, or z is integrated over because the gluon can be at any z, but if it is at given z, it scatters equally with the Wilson line at z. And there are two, two matrices, Tb and Ta, for the emission here and there, right? Uh, so that, that's a well defined color structure, obvious here. In the virtual piece, what scatter is the quark and the antiquark, the original dipole, so we have the same color factor as for the original dipole. And, and then we have, uh, sorry, and we have a factor CF, which because we have a TA here and TA there, and the trace of TA, TA gets factor CF. So it's that very simple. Okay, um, if you look at the other right hand side of this equation, you start with a, with a dipole as matrix and say, what, how does the dipole as matrix? changes after one step in the evolution. Well, it already changes in a dramatic way. We start with a dipole, and we have a contribution here which is not a dipole anymore. It's a, it's a, um, it's a triple pole because it has three points, x, z, and y. And it, it involves also a, a gluon state. So uh, you, you couple the evolution of a quark-antiquark -quark pair to that of a quark-antiquark -quark gluon system. And you, you may imagine that if you add one more gluon, you will, you will do an, an additional gluon emission. So you have a four particle system and so on. So the evolution is not closed. We generate an hierarchy of equation. And that, that's the correct way of, of quantum mechanical evolution. Whenever we have closed equation, it's a, it's a simplification. In reality, we produce more partons, they can interact. So the normal way is not to have closed equations. OK, so it's not a surprise. We have one initial gluon, which is measured by the scattering. Nevertheless, it's good to know that there is a simplification occurring in the limit of a large NC. In that case, we can rewrite this equation effectively as a, as a closed equation. And let me explain that to you. So now I'm going to, to the version of the same equation in the large NC limit. At large NC, one can replace the gluon by a quark anti quark pair. The gluon is always a quark anti quark pair plus a singlet, minus a singlet. But the singlet is less important if NC becomes larger and larger. So in the large NC limit, I can just replace the, the gluon by a quark anti quark pair. And then the emission of a gluon by the dipole is just tantamount to the dipole splitting into two, two dipoles. So I had one dipole start with, now I have two dipoles. You see that, that's a real piece from here. Now I have two dipoles with scatter, x, z, and v, y. Or that's the virtual piece. I have the same dipole with scatter, but with a radiative correlation for the probability. And the mathematics is such that the expectation value of the product of two dipoles factorizes in, in, the, in the large NC approximation. So, I have here two dipoles, they scatter a priori in a correlated way, but if I take the expectation value of the product and I take the large NC limit, then all the correlation between the scattering of that dipole and scattering of that dipole vanish away because they're independent color singlet object. So any color exchange between the two will be suppressed at large NC. So I can replace a product of two dipoles by the, so the expectation of the, of, of the product of two dipole operators by the product of the expectation values of the two independent operators. And then I have here the square of the same quantity as here, it is a closed but nonlinear equation. And that represents this to, to, to graphs of large NC. On top of the, self, on the exchange graphs, I also have self energy graphs where the gluon is emitted and reabsorbed by the same quark, it's crossing the shock wave or, or not. The core structure is exactly the same as before. Here's a two dipole, scatter, a two dipole splitting and both dipole scatter. Here is two dipole splitting, but only the original dipole scatter. So I have the same structure as large NC as before. The kernel is slightly different because now I have to have the same point x for the emission and for the absorption. So I go backwards here and I replace y here by x and I get x minus z times x minus z squared, which makes a squared divided by this, which is fourth, so makes one over x minus z squared, which I have here. Sorry. And of course, this is for the case where the gluon is emitted and reabsorbed by the quark at x. I have a similar diagram when the gluon is emitted and reabsorbed by the anti-quark at y. 
but I just replace here x by y, and this in the get over. So that's all. I have I have the uh, exchange graphs, and I have self energy graph at, for the quark, and I have self energy graph on the anti quark. I add them, them together, and I get BK equation. So that's BK equation. The change in the S matrix due to one step in the evolution, as we as the, uh, you know, as the evolution equation with respect to the, the rapidity step delta y, which involves on the right hand side two possibilities real scattering, so the two dipole scattering minus virtual scattering, or only, only the original dipole scatters, and with a kernel called a dipole kernel, just this precise form, and which come out by summing together the, the two types of kernels we had before, those like this for real terms, and those like this for virtual terms. And the sum of the, the, the for the contributions is, has the similar properties. So you, you can see this, uh, this kernel as a total square. So you can, you can check that this and is the same as this. It's a difference between two y taken williams from the emission from x to z and from the emission to y to z taken to, to module squared. So it, it's, a, it's a positive definite quantity. Okay, so this kernel has very important properties. And they come from the fact that there are cancellations in the, in, 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 of the large distance contribution, largest means z far away from both x and y. Such contribution cancel in between the, between the exchange graph, so the graph where the, the, the gluon is emitted by one quark and absorbed by the other one, and the self-energy graph where the, the gluon is emitted and reabsorbed by the same quark, say this one or that one. As I said before, if this gluon goes very, very far away from the, from the dipole, he does not distinguish anymore between the quark and the anti-quark. You see this graph here and this graph there only differ by the fact that I attach this quark here, or this gluon here or there. But the distance r is, is small, much more than z. So when I do, the, when I do the, the approximations, this distance being much more, this graph and this graph are essentially the same, except for the, for the sign, because the anti-quark here has the opposite charge to the quark there. So these two graphs give essentially the same contribution in the first approximation with different signs. So they're exactly canceled. And this explains why I have this, uh, this difference between two, two graphs here, two terms here. This corresponds to difference between this and this. And this also explains why the dipole kernel has a very um, smooth behavior at large z. It, it, it vanishes very fast at large z. So give, let me make a comparison. If I just look separately I, at, say, at the exchange graphs here, you see the exchange graph alone, well, sorry, the, exchange, the, the self energy graphs alone, where I don't have this cancellation, then at large z, this goes like 1 over z squared. But now if I move to this dipole kernel there, where I have the cancellation, I took both exchange and self energies, and I look at large z, then it goes like 1 over z force, because I have z squared here, z squared there, and times r squared. So at large z, the dipole kernel cancels faster than the individual kernel, and that's just a, it's a dipole property. A, a dipole scatters less than a quark, or an anti-quark, because at large distances a quark, a dipole is essentially a zero charge object. From the, by the same footing, this, this cancellation ensures that when x is equal to y, the dipole kernel cancels. It has to cancel because a dipole of zero size has no color charge, so it cannot radiate. It's just a colorless point like object, it cannot evolve because it cannot radiate. So the dipole kernel knows about that. And again, this comes out because of the cancellation, sorry, because the cancellation between, between these, these two graphs. Without this cancellation, this will not, if you look at this graph alone, this does not cancel one x equal y, it's just independent of y, the kernel. But once after adding all the contributions, the, the sum of them cancel one x equal y. That's color transparency, of course. And also another, the last property is that when, when you, we look at this kernel here, when x goes to z, there's a UV divergence. When, when the dipole, when the gluon is very close to the quark, there's a UV divergence. But this UV divergence cancel between real and virtual pieces. So between this diagram and that diagram, because if the dipole is the size of this dipole, xz goes to zero, it does not interact anyway. So this dipole here or that dipole there gives the same result up to a sign because this dipole or that dipole, they, they, they both don't interact. This, are, this one does not cross the shock wave. This crosses the shock wave, but it's so small that it does not interact either. So just by, by color transparency, this contribution and this contribution are the same. and They exactly cancel this against that, which, which ensures that this equation has no short distance uh, pole either. It has no short distance poles and has a very, uh, very uh, smooth behavior uh, at, large, at large separation, at large z, at like one over f force, that force. And that makes the equation well defined numerically, mathematically, and it can be solved. Okay, so uh, to see the relation with BFKL, which is a linear equation, it's convenient to rewrite the equation in terms of the scattering amplitude. So we write s as one minus t. And then you have 
three linear terms and a quadratic term. The three linear terms describe the independent evolution of three dipoles. The original one, which decays with time, so it has a minus sign, and the two new ones are created, xz and zy. And the quadratic term, txz, dzy, describe the simultaneous scattering of the both produced dipoles. So that's a multiple scattering. That's what props these fluctuations. I, I mentioned to you before that it was very important to keep trace of the, of the simultaneous scattering of both di daughter dipoles in this uh, kind of cartoon, see? This, I have two daughter dipoles here, between this one and that one, and they both scattered. This T squared piece is this quadratic piece. That simultaneous scattering makes the difference between BFL and BK. It introduces uh, unitarity conservation. Very important. So, if I neglect the, the quadratic piece, I get BFL equation. That's a linear equation, can be solved, very well understood, and it has problem. You have unitarity evaluation. So, but still, let, let's see what happens with the, with the BF Cal equation. So this is a BF Cal equation. It's a linear equation, so it can be solved by, 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 by um, a linear operator, in, by like, like Fourier transform. In this case, it's not really Fourier transform, it's Merlin transform. Um, why Merlin transform? Because this, uh, this equation has a very nice property. It, con it's, it's, uh, it has conformal symmetry. It is um, it, it's unchanged. For instance, if you have a if you have a dilation of all the coordinates x, y, and z by the same quantity a, if you make such a dilation, then the kernel, the dipole kernel, times the measure is invariant. So using this property, one it it is this ensures that all the pure powers are eigenfunctional of, of this kernel with this d two z integration. So the action of the kernel means acting with the dipole kernel and integrating over z. So this convo, this this uh, convolution here means integrate over z. So if I act with the dipole kernel on a power r power to gamma with any gamma between zero and one, I'm sure that I'm going to recover that power times some eigenfunction. And this eigenfunction is computed, was computed by Ribato first, and it has a well-defined mathematical structure in terms of the, of the derivative of the gamma Euler function. That's not important for our follows. It's important that the power, the pure powers, at the power to gamma, are eigenfunction of the kernel with well-defined eigenvalue. Because of that, one can construct the general solution to this equation as a superposition of pure power. So that's, that's a pure power-like solution, which is indexed by the index gamma. It's like Fourier transform, but gamma plays the role of the energy or the momentum in the Fourier transform. It is the power. So a pure power solution is just solving this equation on the eigenfunction. It's r to power to gamma times, you see, you exponentiate this, this, this eigenvalue. And then a superposition of any such a, Con, uh, any such um, um, uh, um, eigenfunctions with initial condition, which, which, sorry, with coefficient which de depend on initial condition, will, de will represent the general solution to this equation. But as you can see, each of the eigenstates diverges exponentially when y goes to zero because you, they, they can come diagonal in gamma space. We so just divide the y is like a, like a um, um, uh, you know, ex exponential increase, like a um, radi 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 radioactive de decay is something which goes exponentially with, with, with time, and time is y here. So each of the modes grows exponentially with y, so, so does the superposition. So the solution in general will violate unitarity. And, but at this point, when the, when the T matrix becomes for the one, the nonlinear term becomes important, becomes important, and it restores unitarity. If you look at the right hand side here, you see that when T is one, these four terms exactly cancel. So T equal one, which is a black disk limit or total absorption limit, is a fixed point. The equation cannot have t bigger than one. If you start with a t which is more than one, which is BFKL, you, you, you keep solving this equation, t becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. When, and when t is exactly one, the right hand side exactly vanishes and the evolution stops. So the, the unitarity limit or the black limit is a fixed point of the equation. That's the simplest realization of unitarity. It could be more complicated than that, but that's so simple. So then, uh, of, of course, to, 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 to study the approach to unitarization and saturation momentum in particular, we have to solve this equation which is nonlinear. The linear equation has no saturation. And one can define saturation momentum QS as the value R such that T of R and Y is, has a given value, say 0.5, right? Why 0.5? It can be anything between 0 and 1. We like to have a transition between T much more than 1 and T of order 1. And the definition of saturation momentum depends upon the, I mean, QS depends upon the definition. So we define it in terms of 0.5, we find a scale. If we define it in 0.6, it would be a slightly different scale. It's, it's irrelevant. Um, so we like to solve this equation numerically, if you want, because it's a non equation. And then from this condition, we can infer the saturation scale. That's a very well defined problem. I will show you the numerical solution. But one can go a long, a, a way long, a long, longer without using numerics by using 
numeric by using analytic solutions. One can infer the saturation scale from the solution to the linear BFKL dynamics. Because you see, the saturation scale is when the solution to the BFKL dynamics becomes large enough. So you just take the solution to the linear equation, which I showed to you before was given by this kind of powers. I take one of the solutions, I just and I just I say, okay, when this solution becomes for the 0.5, then I define the saturation momentum. So I take the BFKL solution, which I know it is a pure power, and I replace R as 1 over QS. So you see it's 1 over QS squared to power to gamma because I, before I had R to power to gamma here, and I replace R by 1 over QS. Q0 is a scale from initial condition, just there for, for dimension reasons, and this is the exponential increase. So when, I, when this is for the 0.5, I use this as an equation to extract QS squared as a function of, of Y. And you see, it's easy to solve. You have QS squared is Q0 squared times E to alpha chi of gamma Y divided by gamma. So that is this is a simple argument, which is correct, by the way, for, for deep reasons, but, it's, but it's, it's not obviously correct, but it's correct. The simple argument is telling us that the saturation momentum increases exponentially with rapidity, which means as a power one over X. And it's also giving us the, the power. Well, for the time being, gamma here is not fixed because I told you that the, the, the general solution is obtained as a superposition of a gamma, it's a main representation. But by looking at the subtle point in that superposition, one can find the most likely value of gamma, which is what I call gamma S, gamma saturation, which turns out to be a pure number, 0.63. And then by inserting here 0.63 and using the expression of the Cartesian function I showed you before, or gamma equal 0.63, one gets the saturation exponent lambda S, which is the prefactor here, as alpha bar times chi of gamma S divided by gamma S. And it's a pure number, it's alpha bar times 4.88. These are pure numbers that come from leading order BFK dynamics. They're totally independent of the initial condition. They're that universality. So this equation goes to the black disk limit in a universal way. And the way it approaches the black disk limit is universal as well. The initial condition plays no role, except for setting the scale here. So the value, Q0 comes from the initial condition. So the value of saturation momentum depends on initial condition. But the way of the saturation momentum depends upon, upon the rapidity. So the saturation exponent is universal. And also this power, which is here, which shows the, the, the slope of the amplitude in the vicinity of saturation is also universal. And this is a solution to the numerical solution to, to BK equation and um, together, with some, to, together with the previous analytic estimate. So this is obtained, this is the saturation front as a function of, of, of rho, which is defined as before, for various value of rapidities. The initial condition, which is this red line at y equals zero, is the envy model. See, it's, this is the S matrix of the envy model, remember? And that's a T matrix, which is one minus S matrix. So you see it's here. It is one below the saturation scale, and it is exponential minus rho at large or color transparency. So this is like this limit color transparency. And that this slope here is the slope of, of the color transparency from the exponent. And then I keep evolving. So the saturation front at y equal 4, at y equal 8, at y equal 12, at y equal 16. So y is a log of 1 over x, so it's a uh, y16 means x like 10 to minus 10. I mean, it's tremendously small x. But the experiments are more sensitive to value from 4 to 8, which corresponds to 10 to minus 4 to 10 to minus 6 for x. But in any case, it's interesting to, to see the universal property for arbitrary large y. And you can see that the, the shape of the, of, the, uh, of the front approaches to, to, the, uh, to the uniform shape, which does not change the energy anymore, and which is different from the beginning. And that, that, that's clear, clear to, simple to understand. At the beginning, the power was R squared in the exponent. So in this Dilute tail, where you can expand the exponential, that was, there was just a power R, to power R squared to power one. Whereas we know that asymptotically, we go to R squared to power two gamma, where gamma is more than one. So you can see the change from gamma equal one in the initial condition to gamma equal 0.63 in the, in the evolution. That's the initial condition, has rapid decrease, and it, gamma is, is one, and here gamma is 0.63. So again, the fact that you start with gamma equal one is irrelevant. Whatever initial condition you put, which goes fast enough to, to zero at large R, large rho, sorry, you automatically get here the universal power 0.63. So that's, again, the universality of the evolution. It's a fixed point of the evolution. So the amplitude is one at saturation, is much more than one ahead of the saturation. The saturation momentum, it's QS, or in this logarithmic variable, rho s, rho s is logarithmic of q s squared divided by q zero squared, obviously, is the point at which the amplitude becomes 0 0.5. So you look, here, here is 0 0.5, right? So this point is the initial saturation momentum. That point is the initial saturation momentum at y equal 4. That point here is saturation momentum at y equal 16, and so on. So I can extract numerical saturation momentum. 
And I can check that strategic momentum grows indeed with, with rapidity in the program unit as expected analytically. So if I go backward here, I have this, this exponential dependence. So now I take the log n, log n of q squared divided by q zero squared is what I call rho s. And this should be the same as lambda s times y, which is here, lambda s times y. And indeed, if you look at the, at the derivative of the log logarithm of, of QSAT with respect to y, or rho, rho s with respect to y, as a function of y, we see that eventually it approaches this value, which is 4.88 alpha bar, which corresponds to this point here. It's not the same as from, uh, at the beginning, we have a slower increase, there's a transitory behavior. So the, the, um, this va asymptotic value is only achieved after some evolution. The, the early stages of evolution is non-universal. The asymptotic one is universal. The same like a power here. The power here at the beginning was minus one, then it was slightly changing, but eventually it was becoming 0.63, and that was universal. And another important property of the solution, I just show here the approximate form of solution piecewise. So T is one at saturation, like this limit. So that means rho is more than rho s, because it means large dipoles. And if it's much more than one, in the tail above saturation, rho bigger than rho s. And in that case, this is simply given by the, by the BF scale solution with this boundary, with saturation boundary condition. And, and, and well, and that, that's, a, that's an ideal result coming from the BF scale. It is very well reproduced by the numeric results here. And if you look, um, this, this result has, is a product of two exponentials. The one is a pure power in terms of r times squared, because this is rho, it's a logarithm. Uh, this is rho, it's logarithm of qs. So this logarithm of rho of r, this logarithm of qs, if you take rho minus rho s and exponential, is the same as r squared times q sub squared to power gamma s. So this, this here, this, this, this function here is the same as the one here. While the second one is rho minus rho s squared divided by, by, um, uh, by something which is proportional to alpha y. This is called the diffusion term because it's diffusion in, in, in the logarithm of transient momentum. See, rho minus rho s squared grows like alpha, squared of, squared like alpha y. So long as rho is close enough to rho s, which is always the case if alpha y is large enough, so this condition is satisfied. Then the second exponential here is negligible because the exponent is much more than one. And then t is essentially given by the first exponential. And this first exponential is a pure power of r squared with the, with the power given in terms of the, the, of the saturation momentum and with the power given by, by gamma s. So th th this is called geometric scaling. Why it's a scaling? Because you see a, a priori t is a function of two independent variables, r and y, if you're in dis, q squared and Birkin x. Nevertheless, in this regime, which is universal, the amplitude given by the BK equation depends upon R and Y via a single combination, the product of R squared times the saturation momentum squared, which itself depends upon Y. So it's a function of a single scaling, scaling variable, which is a dimensional product between the dipole size squared and the saturation momentum squared. The Y dependence is fully given by, 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 by the saturation momentum. You simply say that the QS of Y is a physical intrinsic scale in the problem. So all the properties of the dipole amplitude depend upon the dipole size air if measured in unit of, of one over QS, because there is no other intrinsic scale in the problem but QS. So when A is of one over QS, this becomes of order one. That would be the approach to arbitrarity. When A is much more than one over QS, where in this regime of dilute, then A is much more than one. And this is a good approximation in the vicinity of the saturation line. Oh, sorry, was a, yes, of the saturation point. So for rho close to rho S. In the, in the way, in, the, in that sense, rho is bigger than rho s, but much more than this, than this um, um, right hand side, which depends upon y. So we, we, when y is large enough, the larger is y, the wider the window in which we see the geometric scaling hold. That's a very important property. Whenever you have scaling, you're happy because that's, that's the universal property of the system. It, it shows a cell similar system, uh, as Saran was saying. Okay, so now let me return a bit to, to, uh, to the data. It turned out that the geometric scaling was first observed in the data before it was understood from the dynamics of the BK equation. So these are data, these are analysis of the data which goes back to 2000. Uh, uh, at that time, Golek, Bernard, and Vustov made the, the, the first saturation fits to the to, to DIS. They used this dipole factorization together with a phenomenological expression for dipole cross-section which is very similar to the envy model, except that there was no log in exponent. So the log is missing here, and that's a very, very bad approximation for the tail of the distribution, but for the heat was fine. And they, 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 they observed that they can fit very well the data if they take this function QS, of, Q, Q, Q squared, QS squared of X as a pure power one over X with the, with the exponent lambda being, being 0.3. So they just observed that this simple ANSAT give a good fit. But then they realized that this ANSAT 
has by the by construction this simple property that it depends upon r and x only via the product r times qs of x. So it has geometric scale built in. So they say, okay, this ANDA has geometric scale built in, and it reproduces the data. So maybe the data show geometric scaling. So then they, they, they did an independent analysis in which they didn't use the, the, the specific form. They just have plotted all the, all the data at here at mole x <coughs> in terms of the scaling variable, which is q squared divided by q sub squared of x with this q sub squared. And they just show that the data in this paper, the data for values x and q squared fall all on the same curve when plotted as a function of, of Q of tau, which is the ratio of Q squared divided by Q sub squared over X. So they've shown that the data shows scaling. So the, in that sense, the geometric scaling property was a property of the data independently of the way that they, they come to this observation, which was a property of the model. They start with the model which has this property. This model was fitting the data. So they understood that the data must have this property. And then they showed that the data showed this property independent of the model. And that was, was a very important observation because it, it triggered a lot of interest. And that's essentially what, what led to all this, uh, this solution I mentioned to you before. That was obtained just two years after the, the experimental observation by Sabian's group. Uh, OK. But let me come to, 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 to an important point. Uh, I just said that the data are well produced by this kind of simple uh, scaling behavior. If the saturation momentum scale increases with 1 over x, as 1 over x to the power lambda, where lambda is 0.3. Whereas previously I told you that lambda s, given by the leading order bk, is 4.88 times alpha bar. If alpha bar is 0.25, which is a reasonable value in that range, or 0.2, then this lambda is 1 to 1.2. So it's, it's huge. It's four times, three to four times bigger than the experimental value. And this parameter is, is a parameter for, is a speed for the exponential increase. So having an exponential increase with a, with a speed which is still four times bigger than the, the realistic one is a disaster. So uh, this, this increase is way too fast to be consumed with the data. So it was clear that the leading order decay equation, although it shows qualitatively the right trend, it gives numerically, quantitatively very bad results. And then it was soon realized that a much better result are obtained from the point of view of phenomenology if instead of using a fixed coupling in, in, in a BK equation, one is using a running coupling. By, by, this is the, the saturation exponent for the fixed coupling, which at large y is like 1.2, fixed coupling 0.25. And this is the, the, the running coupling, sorry, that's the, the saturation exponent as obtained by, by simply solving BK equation with a running coupling, but putting by hand a running coupling, which depends upon, with, with arguments of the running depending on the dipole sizes in a, in a reasonable way. And in this case, you see lambda is 0.3, between 0.2 and 0.3, depending on the rapidity. So you go from 1.2 to 0.3. So it's a dramatic decrease. And uh, um, so uh, this dramatic decrease allowed for a su successful phenomenology based on the running coupling version of BK. So that works very well. But then one can, may wonder the question, uh, the, putting the running coupling is formally a next leading order effect, one of the next leading order effects. So first, why by just changing from leading order to next to leading order, one is decreasing the value of the parameter by a factor of three. It means that the perturbation C is not convergent. Well, I think one can have doubts. And second, what about other analog corrections? Why just the running coupling does the job? So it was like a bit of a mystery, right? It was very nicely working, but was somehow unexpected and was too nice to be true in a way. But eventually one understood why it works. And it, it, the, the bottom line is that the, the running coupling corrections are the most important ones. And they're indeed very important in this problem. In fact, in the same way as they're important in the Diglap problem. Diglap equation at leading order has running coupling. The BFK equation formally at leading order has fixed coupling, but the fixed coupling approximation is very bad because running coupling is as important in BFK as it is in Diglap. And um, let me give an, uh, an argument why it's so important. Well, simply speaking, we are looking at dipole sizes at, close to a saturation momentum. So you see, this is t, uh, where t is one half is saturation momentum, be rho s at that rapidity y1. When you go to a higher rapidity, y2 bigger than y1, then the front progresses, and the position of the, of the saturation momentum is like one half, is, is a larger rho, which is rho of y2. So we're always looking at, at dipole sizes around saturation scale. So the typical scale, which should control the running of the coupling, should be a saturation momentum itself. You can say this running, the running is, of course, is very slow. It's just logarithmic. But the saturation momentum itself grows like an exponential of the rapidity. So if you put here under the logarithm the exponential of the rapidity, you discover that the running of the cup, that the running coupling decreases the rapidity dramatically. That's one over y. So it's a, it's a power law decrease. 
coming from, from the log multiplying an exponential, if you want. So if you go here in this numerical results from y equal 4 to y equal 16, then you have decreased alpha by a factor of 4. That's a tremendous effect. It's not like running, the slow and uh, nice and gentle logarithmic decrease of the running of the copies. It does decrease, but it decreases in a dramatic way. So, so the, the revolution slows down dramatically because the running coupling is decreasing dramatically. And because the revolution slows down, and because the, 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 the speed of the evolution is a saturation exponent, indeed saturation exponent is, is drastically reduced. Sorry, go to the run. Going from fixed coupling to running coupling, one reduces the speed by a factor of three to four. Is exactly what, what the running coupling does. The, run, the, the coupling decreases by a factor of three to four when increasing the rapidity by a factor of three to four because the running is inverse proportional to rapidity. Thank you. Okay, I will, I will stop here with running coupling because these are, these are some fits which go very well. So running coupling BK does a very good job in fitting the data. It also fits pretty well the um, cross section for part reproduction in proton nucleus collision. Here it was in deuteron gold collision at, at RIC. So these are experimental points and these are experiment, uh, numerical curves obtained by solving running coupling BK. And you can see a uh, very nice, very nice fits, which are in the meantime uh, become even better by, acting, by adding other analog corrections. I will not insist in that sense. I would like to, because the time is short, I would like to, to very rapidly introduce for you the, the GMOC evolution. So what, what, when and why should we go behind BK? So, so far, we have the BK equation, which is relatively simple and phenomenologically successful, but it has some limitation. It's a large NK approximation. It's a leading order in PQCD plus running coupling correction, and it, it only applies to a very simple project, which is the color dipole. Now, are these limitations serious? Well, yes, they are. The large NK approximation is not so serious. It really it works surprisingly well, so it's not really an approximation. You can you can live with the large NC approximation forever. On the other hand, leading order PKC is stable. We have shown to you before that if you forget running coupling correction, then it is just um, it's just not applicable. Adding running coupling miraculously improves the result, but will be still good to understand the other analog corrections, which are still missing at this level. Moreover. The restriction to a single project, to, a, to the core dipole projectile, is also a, a strong limitation because, depending on the physical problems, we may be sensitive to much more complicated observables. So far, I only discussed two physics problems: DIS and PA collision for single particle production. Both of them were uh, were chosen to be sensitive to the dipole, but there are infinitely many problems which are which are sensitive to, to color configuration more complicated than a dipole. And for those e con configurations, the BK equation simply doesn't apply. So. GMOC equation goes beyond large NC and applies to any kind of configuration of, of gauge invariant configuration of wheels online. So it applies, so it, it, it removes this, this first problem and also the first problem three. So I will discuss for you GMOC equation, which solves problem three. And as, 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 uh, in so far as the NLO equations are concerned, uh, by now we have a, a full NLO calculation of the BK equation. And, both these points are discussed in my notes, but I will not have the time to discuss the analog calculation, so that we'll find it on the slides, but I will just rapidly pass to the, the, to the GMO equation. So GMO equation at leading order, which is a finite NC evolution, and which applies to any kind of projectile in terms of color structure. So let me, just, as a motivation, just give you an example where you need something more than a dipole. Consider you look at the two particle production in PA collisions. So you have a shock wave, you have a proton, and out of this proton, you take a quark, but you don't measure just a quark. You only measure two particles. If, they, if you measure them at both, rap, uh, both of them at four rapidities, then the most uh, plausible scenario is that the two particles at, at four rapidities are a quark from the proton, together with a gluon that has been emitted by, the, by that quark, either before or after the scattering with the nucleus. So it is very similar to the calculation we had before of the single particle production, but now we have two particle production, and the second particle is radiated by the first one in the presence of the shock wave. So now in the final state, we have, this is an amplitude. The amplitude is the sum of these two, ampli the, these two graphs. And then you have to take the module squared. So in the final state, when you take the module squared, you have up to four Wilson lines in the cross section. You have up to two Wilson lines, but they both scatter. Here you have two Wilson lines. Here you have only one because only the quark scatter. But you have two Wilson lines in the, in the amplitude. If you take the square of that, you have four Wilson lines in the cross section. And this, so not surprisingly, when you complete this process, you, you get contributions involved, involving product of four Wilson lines, and it's a quadrupole. And if you complicate more, the, the, the final state can have uh, uh, operated with more than four Wilson, can have six two poles and so on. So you like to know how to compute and how to evolve with rapidity expectation value of products of an arbitrary number of Wilson lines. 
with, with color traces, the product is gauge invariant, but there are four width lines. It is not two dipoles, it's, just, it's a single trace with four width lines, so it's a quadrupole. Okay, now not discuss about phenomenology, you know, time I'll just tell you how we do a general evolution which treats any kind of, of gauge invariant project that build with width lines. And it's not only that it's a, it's a large NC, sorry, it's a, it's a finite NC result, but also the philosophy is totally different. GMOC is not built as an evolution of the dilute projectile, but it's directly built as an evolution of the dense target. So the mathematics is much more complicated. The result eventually are similar to the decay equation, the large and C limit, but the derivation is more complicated, and I will only sketch here the idea. So we, now we focus on the smallest evolution of the gluon distribution in the target directly, in the presence of saturation. There is no projectile, no scattering, just the wave function of the target. And when we speak about the wave function, we automatically mean the life on gauge of the target. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a left mover. We work in the A minus equal zero gauge, which is a, it's the most complicated gauge, but that's what we have to do for, the, for studying this kind of evolution. Um, so uh, we have this idea of romanization group that I already discussed to you, that, that the, the color glass weight function as a given scale y represents effectively the color charge density of all the partonic sources with, with all the value x prime bigger than x. All these partonic sources are fast, they have large longitudinal momenta, so they're frozen in some fixed configuration, and they act as sources for the color field at x that we mentioned. And this includes the valence part that was the case of the envy model, but it also includes all the soft gluon with x prime between one and x. That has to be integrated out. Now, as soon as we decrease x, then new quantum degrees of freedom become frozen and must be included in the sources. So one has to consider quantum fluctuations, gluon fluctuation on top of the classical sources we had before and integrate them out in perturbation theory and uh, rewrite the contribution of these new sources as a change in the weight function from when going from y, w at y, at w at y plus delta y. That would be a step in the evolution. And that, uh, that calculation would produce an evolution equation for w, which is a Gmod equation. Let me try to put that in, in some cartoons to be more, more specific. So let me perform one step in the quantum evolution. Uh, um, so I, I decrease x from x to bx, where b is a number of much more than one. So I want to make a step in the evolution. I'd, to start with, I had a color glass weight function, which gives me all the correlation at the scale x, in particular two-point function, but also n-point functions. And now I integrate out one ladder of quantum gluons with x prime between bx and x. These are really quantum fluctuations as given by the, by the path integral in the one-loop approximation because I would do small fluctuations. But there's, the fluctuations are small, but they're computed in the background of a strong field. So I have to do a one-loop background field calculation exactly in the background field. And by adding the effect of these fluctuations to the original three-level amplitude, I have to be able then to show that the, the, the result of this renormalization can be rewritten as a new a modified two-point function at the new scale bx. If I manage to show that, that by adding fluctuation to the original two-point function at x, I got a new two-point function at scale bx, then my, pro my normalization group program is successful. It's not guaranteed to work. The fact that it works is a proof by construction. But it works, otherwise we'll, uh, I will not discuss about Dumont equation. And since in, 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 so in, we, each, in we, each step we do uh, one loop calculation in the background field, uh, this becomes eventually a nonlinear equation because it mixes, see, the two-point function in the previous step with a four-point function in the previous step with the n-point function in the previous step because I can have arbitrary many insertions. So each new step is all ordered in the, in, the, in the color field from the previous steps. So it's a fully nonlinear equation. And this equation, it never does a second order differential, function differential equation. Why second order? Because it's only the two-point function which is modified by quantum fluctuation. It's modified in a nonlinear way in the background field, but only the two-point function, because I look at small fluctuations as the one-loop um, um, change in the, in the quantum action. So it's a second order function differential equation with a kernel which depends upon the background field in the previous steps to all orders via Wilson line. So the nonlinearity is hidden in, the, in, in this kernel here. So, that, that's like a diffusion uh, operator. It said that the, the, derivative, the special derivatives are replaced with function derivatives with respect to rho. So that's what the color glass in the previous step, d by d rho acts on this, the, 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 the wave function in the previous step, and this is a change in the, in the wave function due to one step in the evolution. And of course, the whole non-trivial dynamics is hidden in the specific form of the kernel chi that I don't show you to, probably here. 
But I I'm going to show a, a different version of this equation, which is even more explicit, and we, which is the one which is used in practice, which is called the Langevin version of this equation. And that's, that's, a, that's a useful digression at this level, because you may know already, if you have maybe have experience with the, with the Brownian motion, you may know that the Brownian motion can be alternatively and equivalently formulated either as a stochastic Langevin equation or as a diffusion focal Planck equation. They're both mathematically equivalent, and they show the same physics. So, and that's also the case here. This equation I showed to you before, the Gmonk equation, which was a second order functional diffusion equation, can be rewritten as a, as a Langevin equation in a functional space. And this Langevin equation in functional space can be solved numerically. And Fjordan, for instance, does that on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, but let me give you start with a simple example. Brownian motion in one dimension. And I start with the Langevin form. What, what's Brownian motion? It, it, so it, the particle has a coordinate x, and it suffers a force, dx by dt, well, an axis, sorry, a, a velocity, so a velocity which is, which is random. So at, at time t, you get a kick nu of t, where nu is a random quantity with expectation value zero, and with two-point function, which is, is local in time. That's what's called the white noise. I'm on, I'm on that. Uh, this is a stochastic equation. It's not a differential equation, so this notation is just formal. It only makes sense if you discretize time. So if you write the time as n times epsilon, or epsilon the step on the step in time, then this um, this differential equation should be properly written as x n minus x n minus one divided by epsilon is equal to nu n. And this uh, expectation value here, of course, the expectation value of nu n is zero. I didn't write it, but the expectation value of nu n times nu m, so two different times t n and t m is d divided by epsilon times delta mn. So one over epsilon delta delta mn is the regularization of the delta function. And now, if you consider the expectation value of xn minus xn minus one, of course, this is proportional to epsilon times expectation value of nu n, which is zero. So on the average, the, 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 the position of the particle does not change. But now if you look at the expectation value of delta n squared, which is the diffusion, then you find epsilon squared as nu n squared. And the expectation value of nu n squared itself goes like one over epsilon, which kills the power of epsilon from here. So you end up with the right hand side with linear in epsilon. So you conclude that the expectation value of x squared obeys a genuine differential equation, which predicts, of course, that x squared goes linear with time, that's diffusion. Whereas the, the instantaneous value of x does not obey a genuine differential equation, but it obey what's called a stochastic equation. So that's Langevin equation, that's a generic uh, uh, differential equation. And this process, which is uh, um, which is present in terms of, of, of a Langevin um, uh, equation, is fully equivalent with a focal Planck equation for the probability p of x and t to have the particle at point x at time t, knowing that it was at point uh, zero at time zero. This probability obeys this equation, the, the Poisson equation or the, the heat equation, and the solution is this one. And if you use uh, if you use this probability from here to compute the expectation value of x squared, get exactly that x squared is equal to dt as here. And one can show many ways that, in fact, these two stochastic processes, one in terms of Langevin equation and the other one in terms of, of the probability for a process uh, for time x at time t, uh, for point x at time t, uh, did exactly my, uh, equivalent to each other. Well, Gmonk equation is like this equation. It's a, it's a, it's a functional focal Planck equation. And in the same way as this equation will admit a Langevin equation representation, the Gmonk equation also admits a uh, representation as a Langevin process, but in the space, in the functional space of the Wilson line. And I will not uh, give you too many details, I'll just show you the, the result. So uh, a Langevin process means that you go from step n in, 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 in time, and time here is rapidity, so that was n epsilon was the original rapidity, n epsilon plus epsilon is y plus delta y, so you go from y to y plus delta y, and if you know the Wilson line at y, the Wilson line at y plus delta y is obtained by, by gauge rotation on the left and on the right with a field in the exponent which is random. So what is the field here? It's a y cycle Williams field created by a source nu, and this source nu itself, it's what? It's a color charge in the Lycon gauge of the quantum gluons. They're quantum, they're random. And they're quadratic distributed because we do one loop calculation. So it, see, this new I are simply the gluons we iterate in one step of the evolution. We work in the Lycon gauge, so we're only sensitive to the, to the transverse component of the field. So new I, it's a, it's a JI component of the current of the quantum fluctuations. Each of these current acts as a source for a classical field for a given uh, set of charges new. 
And this is a classical field in the Lycon gauge, as we discussed many times, the, Lycon, the bicycle William field. But these color charges themselves are quantum because they come from one calculation, and this is the weight of that one calculation after the appropriate scaling. So that's a way to write a one loop calculation with one loop fluctuations, Gaussian fluctuations, as a Langevin process. And this Langevin process has been made to be, um, to be numerically tractable, and this is how Langevin, so the Gibbock equation is explicitly solved in practice, and that's an example of a result. This is the, the dipole S matrix, what we called before S of R, that's a fully transformed, or, you know, that's just S of R as a function of, of R and as a function of R times QS for different rapidities, as obtained this time, not from BK, but from GMOC. And what, of course, that's just an example, one can do much more than that, and I'll, I'll just stop here because that's the end of my, my time. The, 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 the remaining part of my talk was about the next new equation to BK equation. It's a long story about that. There are 10 slides about it. I'll put them there, so, but uh, I will not have the time to discuss them. So, so by, by the way, starting with tomorrow, I will move to, uh, to the jet quenching problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the Morris evolution. But uh, of course, you can ask, still ask questions about Morris evolution now or tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Edmond. Is there any question? So I actually have, oh. Rajiv? Can you go back to your slide 67, I think it was. 67, sorry. Um, okay. I was going the opposite around. Or oh, maybe one board. Uh, uh, there is data shown at some point. Yes, before. No, no, no. Actual data where you showed the uh, RC BK fits are huh, here. Uh, my question was whether this data uh, can also be fit by traditional dig lab. Because when you see PDG, uh, then they seem to suggest that entire F2 data can be fit by dig lab. Yeah, yeah, there, there is a long discussion about that. So, uh, so first of all, I, 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 contradict, I disagree with that statement. That, that, there was a long time an ambiguity, so long as the data was not precise now. Those data are old, so those data can be fitted by anything. Yeah, but I'm talking about PDG of nine, uh, uh, yeah. 2018. The, the, most, the, the most recent one, of course, you can make a global fit, because the global fit, you, you, you just use as many parameters as you want. But if instead of making global fit, you fit only the data at Q squared above 10 GeV by using the GLAP, and then you ex extrapolate the fit to what Q squared lower than 10 GeV squared, then it's, it's totally crap. So a fit which is constrained only by the data above 10 GeV by the GLAP does not manage to, to, to describe this data properly at small x and at Q squared below 10 GeV. Or vice versa, if I do a, a fit only on the small x point and up to Q squared about 10 GeV, and then I extrapolate that up to 600 GeV, it goes perfectly. So in, a global fit, you can, if, you have, if you have enough parameters, you can always do a global fit. There's no secret about that. Of course, you can describe everything. Right. I'm not talking about global fit. I'm talking about only data. No, no, no. no. And, and, and in the particle the data group, doing, in the particle the data group, is only doing no, no, let me finish now. Particle data group actually global has fit. Uh, figures of the data, including Hera and earlier, sure, sure, where you can see fit. on the log x okay. square and log q square plot a straight line. That's always global fit by definition. So dig lab physics, they never fit small x physics. That they, would be nonsense. They know that. That's what I was saying, that it actually exists in data. Yes, but they do global fits. Global fits means up to Q squared is 10,000 GV squared. I will not use... An, I, I would tend to believe that your geometric scaling that you showed just before versus this figure, uh, I didn't calculate chi-square, but they both are essentially of the same quality. No, they will not be able to show geometric scaling. Their fits don't show geometric scaling, although they show the data. Because their, their fits are constrained by the data at high Q squared. No, no, I'm saying that there are two possible explanations possible for the same set of data. You can interpret it in this way, but you can also interpret it to be consistent with DGLA. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't show, so I'm, uh, I should have showed to you that because in the original paper by, by um, uh, these people here, they have two curves. One for the data at x up to 10 minus 2 and q squared up to, up to 45 GeV squared, and one from the data of any x and, q, and any q squared. When you go to the second set of data, then you, you cover the whole plane. There's no geometric scaling. But geometric scaling only holds a small x. Uh, so the second related question is that you, you also showed that when you fit 
the running coupling, yes. then your thing went down to 0.3. As I said, now these are understood. We have the full NLO. Only. No, no. Okay, there one more actually, which where it went down. Mm -hmm. uh, here, uh, my question was: What is the value of Q square at which this running coupling is evaluated? So depends upon why, right? Um, the the phenomenology is somewhere here below ten. No, typically. So that could be around two GeV squared. So the QS is like one point four or one point six. Depend. It's for, for a nucleus, of course. So the alpha S is typically, yeah, we can, it's like 0.25, a typical value. Okay, is there any further questions? Um, I actually have one question. So you spoke about the Langevin equation and how Jim Wall can be expressed to leading order, expresses the Langevin equation. Do you expect this to persist when one goes to, okay. So this, um, a statistical Brownian motion interpretation only holds for In my opinion, yes. So, in any case, so far has not been demonstrated before leading order. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if there is no further questions, let's thanks Edmond again. <laughs>